Number 1. Anderson was last seen in Williamsburg, Kentucky at 8.30 p.m. on February 11, 2018. She got out of her mother's vehicle on Route 92 West near the Pilot Travel Center after an argument with her boyfriend, taking a bag of clothes with her. She has never been heard from again. Authorities initially believed Anderson had left of her own accord and stated there were possible sightings of her in Tennessee after her disappearance. However, in September 2018, Joseph Samuel James Bauer was charged with complicity to commit murder, complicity to first-degree robbery, complicity to tampering with physical evidence, and complicity to being a convicted felon in possession of a handgun in her death. A photo of Bauer is posted with this case summary. He confessed to his involvement in her death after he was jailed on unrelated charges. Bauer initially said Anderson's body was thrown off the Savoy Bridge into the Clear Fork River. A search of the area turned up a single bone, but it turned out not to be human. When questioned again, Bauer changed his story and said Anderson was buried in a shallow grave in a dry creek bed off a gravel road. Although cadaver dogs indicated the presence of human remains in the area, a search turned up only more animal bones. In September 2019, Bauer was sentenced to a total of 10 years in prison after pleading guilty to complicity to commit murder and facilitation to commit robbery in Anderson's case. He got five years for each charge. Investigators believe he and at least two other individuals killed Anderson shortly after she went missing and that her murder was committed during a drug-related robbery. No other suspects have been charged in her death. Anderson's body has not been found, but foul play is suspected in her case due to the circumstances involved. This is only the second time in Kentucky history that a person was convicted of a murder-related charge without a body being found. Number 2. Apker was residing at her mother's home in Newtonsville, Ohio in 1999. She left her mother's residence on November 18, 1999, and was last seen the next day by friends at, at the Cross Country Inn, now Super 8, in the 2300 block of Royal Drive in Fort Mitchell, Kentucky. She departed from the hotel, apparently to meet her ex-husband, Mike George, and, and has never been heard from again. She left her son behind when she vanished. George and Apker had had a stormy relationship, and he was involved with a motorcycle gang based in Cincinnati, Ohio. George was imprisoned twice in the 1990s, and he had just been released from custody when Apker vanished. Apker was reportedly very afraid of him and his gang associates, and she told her family to contact police if they didn't hear from her every day. George disappeared at the same time Apker did, and her family believes he may have been involved in her disappearance, but law enforcement authorities have not identified him as a suspect. They would like to speak with him, however. He is described as a brown-haired, blue-eyed man who was 36 years old at the time of his and Apker's disappearances. He is 5'9 tall and weighs 170 pounds. Photographs of him are unavailable. Although police have found no hard evidence of foul play in Apker's case, her family stated she had been afraid for her life prior to her disappearance, and they believe she was murdered. Apker's parents both died after her disappearance, and her son is now serving in the military. Her case remains unsolved. Number 3. Apke resided with his parents in Florence, Kentucky in 2000. He lost his driver's license due to a drunk driving conviction in 1998, but his driving privileges were reinstated in March 2000. Apke bounced several checks in 1997, but paid his fines and the total amounts due by April 2000. His relationship with his girlfriend of three years ended in early March 2000. According to Apke's loved ones, he does not have the type of personality which could be brought down by such events. Apke's family members said that he was planning to turn his life around in April 2000. He secured employment as a garage door installer and even said he was planning to quit smoking cigarettes. His parents last saw him during the evening of April 7 after dinner together. Apke said he was going to meet friends to play pool. He told his family he would return to their residence by 10 p.m., as he was scheduled to begin work the following morning. Apke called home twice later in the evening, the last time at approximately 11 p.m. He told his mother he would be returning later than expected. Apke's family has never seen him again. They stated that it was not unusual for him to leave without warning, and they were not initially concerned about his lack of immediate contact. His employer called his residence on April 9 and said he never reported for work as scheduled. He was at the Strass Haus on Main Street in Covington, Kentucky during the evening hours of April 9. His friends told authorities that he was celebrating the reinstatement of his driver's license. 
Aki's former girlfriend was also at the bar and said that he was drinking heavily during the night. According to a private investigator hired by Aki's family, he may have taken doses of the tranquilizer Valium, in addition to the alcoholic beverages. He was last seen as he departed from Strasshaus at approximately 2.30 a.m. on April 10, which was the bar's closing time. Apke was driving his grandmother's silver 1974 Chrysler Newport at the time of his disappearance. The car was discovered abandoned at approximately 3.20 a.m., less than one hour after Apke departed from the Strasshaus. The vehicle had been wrecked and was located in Boone County, Kentucky, on an Interstate 275 bridge heading towards Indiana. There was no sign of Apke at the scene. There was a high drop-off from the bridge to the water below, but there were no indications Apke took his own life. According to his family's private investigator, no one noticed any behavioral changes in Apke prior to his disappearance, and no one thought he might be suicidal. An extensive search of the surrounding area produced no clues as to Apke's whereabouts. A passing motorist told authorities that the driver of the wrecked Chrysler Newport entered an unidentified Jeep Cherokee by the roadside shortly after the car crashed. Investigators do not know if Apke chose to leave his home voluntarily or if other factors were involved in his case. It is possible that Apke feared he may have problems with law enforcement and his loved ones after the automobile crash and decided to leave of his own accord. It is unknown if foul play was involved in his disappearance. Apke never claimed his final paycheck from his previous employer before his disappearance. He has experience working as a cook in restaurants. Apke's case remains unsolved. Number 4 The Line J. Lawrence Barrick was an organized woman who stuck to her routine. A widow since 1982, she lived alone in her cabin near Nolan River Lake in Edmondson County, Kentucky, with her Pomeranian named Fifi. For Aline, Friday, April 12, 1996 began like any other day. Aline, 61, woke up and went to a chiropractic appointment, Kentucky State Police told Dateline. After her appointment, Aline went to a tanning salon and then stopped by the house of the handyman man she had hired. Then, according to her daughter Kay Biggers, Aline went home. She was supposed to spend the weekend with her brother, Pete Jackson, in Frankfort, Kentucky, but called her sister-in-law to tell her she wasn't coming. She gave no explanation as to why. Around 2.30 p.m. that day, Aline took her dog Fifi for a walk in her neighborhood, near Mammoth Cave National Park. The gated community consisted of a few cabins, but most of the neighbors were seasonal vacationers, Kay told Dateline. Police told Dateline that during her walk, Aline saw some teenagers who were staying at a cabin nearby, and she stopped for a casual conversation with them. Police would later learn that when Aline went home, she began with her bedtime routine. She had closed her blinds, put a clean trash bag out to take out her old trash, and had lit a cigarette. However, the routine seems to have been interrupted rather abruptly. Aline's cigarette would later be found burned down into the bathroom counter, and her bottom dentures were in the cup she used to clean them. Her top dentures were missing. If she had cleaned her top teeth, she put them back on. Because nobody ever saw her without her teeth. Period K told Dateline. One of Aline's neighbors became concerned when he did not see her walking Fifi over the weekend. That Monday, three days after she was last seen, the neighbor contacted the Edmondson County Sheriff's Office to report his concern. After searching Aline's home and contacting her friends and family, who had not seen Aline, a missing persons report was filed. Kentucky State Police Detective Jason Lanham, previously a lead detective on Aline's case, said the police who responded to the call said there was no sign of forced entry into Aline's home. Kay and her family believe someone Aline knew may have knocked on her door that night. I wouldn't say that it was somebody that she necessarily knew debt. Lanham told Dateline, but there's a good chance it was. Debt. Lanham said police found Aline's car was at her home and her keys were inside her house. Her dog Fifi was in a crate inside the house. Debt. Lanham said there were signs of a possible struggle inside the home specifically in the bedroom. Kay believes Aileen may have been trying to reach a gun she kept in her bedside table. There were very small amounts of blood in the bedroom set. Lanham told Dateline. Kay says the only items missing from the house were Aline's purse, the top bedsheet and Aline. State police have conducted group searches in the area near her house, partially drained lakes, and had scuba divers search nearby. We've had cadaver dogs search as late as the fall and winter of 2016 debt. Lanham said. Debt. Lanham told Dateline the investigation is still ongoing and that while detectives have had some persons of interest, there have been no substantial leads. 
We haven't had enough evidence or leads to make a true suspect or get enough to charge somebody debt, Lanham said. As time goes by, you have fewer and fewer people who know her or remember what happened. Kay said she and her family suspect Aline's handyman, whose house she stopped by at on the last day she was seen, had something to do with her disappearance. Kay said she believes he left the area shortly after Aline went missing and has been arrested since then. Debt. Lanham confirmed to Dateline that police did interview the man at the time and that he had served time in Illinois for crimes unrelated to Aline's disappearance. He did not know if he is still serving time and could not confirm any additional information or release his name to protect the integrity of the case. On the 22nd anniversary of their mother's disappearance, Kay and her family continue to search for a line. It's like having a nightmare that you can never wake up from, Kay told Dateline. She said she hopes to put her mother to rest, adding that a line deserves to be buried and not just be thrown away. A line would now be the grandmother of seven, four girls and three boys. Aline J. Lawrence Barrick would be 84 years old today. She is 5'4 with white hair and green eyes. If you have any information, please contact the Kentucky State Police Department at 270-782-2010. Number 5 David or more commonly known as Dwayne was last seen in Owensboro, Kentucky on July 11, 1986. His family and friends became alarmed when his blue bicycle was found abandoned. His bicycle was found either in an alley near his family's home in the 500 block of East 20th Street or at the home itself. His family stated that Dwayne took good care of his bike and would not have left it alone like he did. Dwayne has never been seen or heard from again. Investigators believe his case is linked to the disappearance of Shannon Green, who vanished five days before Dwayne did in Owensboro. The two had known each other and were at a friend's home together the day before Shannon went missing. Investigators believe that Dwayne might have had vital information regarding Shannon's disappearance. Investigators have long suspected that convicted murderer and sexually offender, John Rainier, was involved in Shannon and Dwayne's disappearances. He was a former friend of Dwayne's family. He claimed that he was innocent of any wrongdoing in Shannon or Dwayne's case. He claimed that Dwayne implicated himself and his own father, David, in Shannon's disappearance. He confessed to strangling her when she went missing. Rainier states he has tape recorded the confession and gave it to police. The tape and any of its record remained undiscovered until 2005. Rainier stated he wanted to kill Dwayne and his father after hearing of their involvement in the case, but never had the chance to do so. Rainier has passed a polygraph in relation to his role in Shannon and Dwayne's disappearance. Dwayne's father maintains his innocence in Shannon's case. He also stated he did not believe his son was involved in it either. He believes that Rainier was responsible for her disappearance and that Dwayne found out about it and was killed so he wouldn't tell police. Investigators still believe that Rainier was involved in Shannon's case despite the taped confessions. It should also be noted that David has given inconsistencies in his story of events leading up to the disappearance of his son. David has not been charged with his son's case or Shannon's. Investigators have also considered that Shannon and Dwayne's case might be linked to the Owensboro abduction and murder of a 23-year-old woman who disappeared from the area on June 17, 1986. Her body was discovered near a boat ramp on October 2, 1986. No connection to that case has been proven, and all cases remain unsolved. Number 6 she disappeared from Eddyville nearly 10 years ago, now Sonia Bradley's daughters are speaking out for the very first time. She knew too much, said Ashley No, Bradley's youngest daughter. That's the whole reason she's not here. Ashley No and her sister, Heather Fleener, share new insight as we learn about changes in the new criminal case against their mother's then-boyfriend. We were really upset, said No. A week ago we were excited, said Fleener. When the family heard their mother's old boyfriend, William David West, was charged with murder, they had new hope. They believed he could lead authorities to Bradley. However, Wednesday all that changed. Charges were amended to tampering with evidence, and West's bond lowered. Yet, a big break could be just days away, as the family says they're now getting some of the best leads they've had in a decade. Bradley's daughters say they are finally starting to put the pieces together that lead up to their mom's disappearance. I see it now, said Heather. Details I didn't see before. Things that now make sense to me. Rooms we weren't allowed into, conversations we heard. When Bradley vanished in October of 2002, Ashley was just 15 years old and Heather 17 years old. Now in their 20s, they say their heartache turned to hope last week then they learned West sat behind bars charged with a Mayfield man's murder. 
They thought maybe West would finally start talking. The sisters believe West knows what happened to their mother. It means everything, said Ashley. Ashley recalls the last time she saw her mother. It was October 9th, the day before Bradley vanished. She walked in on an argument between her mother and West. He was slamming cabinets and I heard a little of their conversation, said Ashley. Ashley says she confronted her mother and told her to leave West. We said some things we should not have said, said Ashley. The next morning I didn't even go in here room before I left home. The next morning, Heather says she left for the day. She came back to find her little sister had been in a bad car wreck. West was the one to tell her. We no more than get in the door and Dave's calling my boyfriend's cell phone saying my sister had a wreck and we needed to do something about my mom, said Heather. Heather says she still doesn't know what West meant by his comment about her mother. They say their hopes shattered when news broke West's recent murder charge had been amended to tamping with evidence. They fear he'll walk this time and take with him any information about their missing mother. They also believe someone they call a higher power is protecting West. They just had to look, it was there, said Heather. They didn't look because of higher powers. That's what I believe. It's their fault my mom is not here. What's more they feel their mother was murdered, a killing they say is just a tip of a much bigger crime ring with ties beyond the heartland. There's a lot more people involved here, more than David, more than a higher power, it's a whole group, said Ashley. Still it was a big break that brought them home. A break they feel is the best shot they've had so far at finding their mother. I hope we bring her home, said Heather. Cold case investigators say they are doing everything they can do to bring this family closure. They are not releasing details about any leads at this time. As for West, his criminal case will go before a grand jury. That could happen as early as next week. He remains in jail on $10,000 cash bond.